Well, hello and welcome back to Principles of Accounting 2. I'm your host, Dr. B, and today we're going to be talking about process costing. Before we jump into process costing, I would like to quickly jump into our classroom and talk about where we are in the course. We, uh, so welcome to week three, right? Oh my goodness, week three, the time is going by so, so quickly. Uh, a little quicker than I would like it, yeah, but you know, it's the nature of life. Okay, so uh, where is week three, you might be wondering. Uh, so you, weeks one and two are in module one uh, on the course homepage, yeah? Week three and four are in module two. So if you go to module two, week three, you'll see our process costing, which is chapter 20. Chapter 21 is uh, cost, volume, profit analysis also known as break even. Uh, so we're going to cover both of those chapters today, uh, probably either tonight or tomorrow. I, I will be posting the exercises for both chapters. So for those of you who like that hands-on experience, you want to try to understand and apply the information a little bit more, I'll post the Excel um, uh, uh, exercises just like I did for the previous chapters. And uh, uh, and remember, a lot of that's from your feedback that you provided to me in, in the last course. So that's that's why we, I try to give you some more example problems, yeah? And and so I'll make sure to get those in uh, either tonight or tomorrow. And uh, so what does that mean for next week? Next week, da 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 mid, the midterm exam. Okay. Uh, so here's the thing about the midterm exam. The midterm exam covers chapters, going back to week one, uh, 17 to 21. 17 to 21 are covered on the midterm exam. The midterm exam, uh, the, the, midterm, the midterm exam is for next, for next week, yeah? And so uh, the midterm exam will cover chapters 17 to 21. Now here's the, here's the kicker. Here's the difference between uh, principles one and principles two. The midterm exam is worth 20% of your grade. Oh, my God, 20%. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, I know. Um, here's why. Here's why. There are only 26, 27 chapters in, the, in, in Principles 2. Principles 2 is a little shorter than Principles 1 is. Uh, and for that reason, that's why the midterm and the final exams are worth 20% each. Yeah. Uh, here's the good news. It's open book, open note. It's open now. Uh, so you're more than welcome to start it. You can save your answers. But the only thing is when you hit submit, it submits it. Yeah. So just be careful around that submit button. Only submit it when you're ready. But that'll be next week. It'll be the midterm exam. There will, will not be a lecture next week. Okay. So you'll have your the whole week to take care of that midterm exam. Now, remember, the midterm exam especially must, and I repeat, must be submitted on time. That midterm exam will not be submitted uh, or accepted late because I need to submit the midterm grades to the university for the course. Yeah. So please, uh, if if you're if you didn't get a chance to complete uh, homework for chapter 19, 18, whatever, you need to get that done uh, because. And uh, you need to get everything else in on time um, because the midterm grades need to be submitted after you take the midterm exam next week. Any questions on that? You go, you're, you're, yeah, you're good? Okay. So, um, so yeah, the midterm exam will be next week. There will not be a class next week. You'll have the midterm exam next week. Uh, so, so just so you're aware that that's coming up. I'm prefacing you now because it's real important, yes? Okay, let's go ahead and jump into that fancy process costing. Uh, so remember, Module 2, Week 3, we're on Chapter 20, uh, Process Costing. So let's go ahead and jump into Process Costing, and we'll, we'll quickly recap what we talked about in the last chapter, which is the job costing, to kind of uh, connect the two, Yeah. Because remember, as you know, with accounting, the information you learned previously builds on what we're learning now. 
Okay, so let's let's remember what we learned about in in job costing. In the last week, we talked about job order. Job order, as you remember, is what we receive a customer order, and we fill the customer order with the exact quantity, uh, with the exact specifications, and in job costing. We're adding the direct material plus the direct labor plus the factory overhead for each job. Yeah. It's quantity times price, quantity times uh, dollars per hour, quantity times, um, uh, you know, you get you, quantity times uh, overhead uh, dollars per hour. We add them all up to get the total cost for each job. Remember, the job costing is the same to say as a customer order. Each job is a separate customer order, okay? So that's what we talked about in, in chapter 19, I think it was, the previous chapter we talked about job costing. Process costing, which is what we're talking about today, is slightly different. In job costing, we had like uh, specialty type of products. Uh, they're made to order. They are um, they're one offs or they or they're batches of of products that are sold at uh, retailers. Right? Process costing is a little bit different. Now, why is that? Th think of the word process. A process is a continuation of a, a task, right? That's a process. Now, if you think about the word process, it's continuous. It's, it's a continuous process. So the type of manufacturers we're going to be talking about today are like food processors. Can anyone give me an example of a food processor, food processing company? Any examples? Restaurant. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, what was that first one? You have Tyson's chicken? Is that a food processor? Yes, company? yes, 100%. Yeah, Tyson's, Kraft, uh, I heard Kraft, um, uh, milk, uh, water. Um, What's the these, question? Types of process uh, companies or, or uh, examples of process companies. Well, uh, wouldn't uh, like the TJ Maxx would be a process company? Amazon. Uh, no, no. Uh, so, so those, so those ones are actually job order companies. Uh, because it, and, and and here's the reason why, Ty Lexus. So, a process company is continuous regardless of the customer's orders. Okay, continuous. An example would be like Poland Springs. They're going to keep making water and selling the water. Okay, regardless, because water is a commodity. Uh, chicken. Tyson is going to keep manufact uh, process manufacturing chicken and selling that to the grocery stores because it's continuous, uh, regardless of how much they're ordering. Yeah. So when you hear the word process, think continuous process, think continuous. Uh, and it's a homogeneous product. Like, so they're only making one thing. Right. That, think of like a dryer's ice cream. That's a, Murray's would be one. Uh, I'm sorry, which one? Murray's. Yes, yeah, I would say that. I would say yes. That, that's a good example. And uh, it, think of like Dryer's ice cream or uh, Ben and Jerry's or uh, you know one of the ice cream manufacturers. Okay, that's a continuous process. They're going to keep making batches of ice cream regardless of the customer's orders. It's continuous. So that's the difference. Job order costing, we're making products uh, to sell to retailers, okay? Um, like toys, for example. 
employees, that's not that's not a continuous thing. That's usually done based off of customer orders. Uh, or if you think of like um, computers, computers, no, that's not continuous. We're not going to just keep making computers for the hell of it. We're gonna we're gonna sell based off of the customer orders. Uh, so those are job order uh, types of of products and companies. Yes, Kovas, please. So then would so like I said craft because I was thinking about the cheese, but then technically you're right. Craft craft is a process manufacturer because uh, you know like Kraft Heinz, uh, that company they make cheese. Uh, they make actually they make a lot of different types yeah. of food products, uh, but they also uh, uh, make Heinz ketchup. Uh, they, they they make spices as well. So Kraft, very big company, by the way, uh, they make a bunch of different products, but but it's still continuous. It's still a process company because uh, they're sold at grocery stores. They're used in restaurants. They're um, they they keep making the product regardless of the customer's order. Okay, they still get it out the door. So so that is Kraft. I would say is a great example of a process company. So yeah, th so these are all great examples. So thank you. Yes. Uh, so if you think of a continuous process, a continuous manufacturing, regardless of customer orders, that is what we call process cost, process manufacturing. And so each, and there's the, it's a series of steps. <clears throat> the cost cannot be directly traced to each individual product, but they can be traced to the process. And I'll, I'll explain that uh, here, here in the next few slides, and I'll give you a couple of examples. And then uh, each process, each process along the way, we apply direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead as the products are being manufactured and moving through the process. So in your mind, I want you to think of, you know, uh, Tyson chicken or, or Kraft or um, Ben and Jerry's or, uh, you know, dryers, ice cream, you know, one of those types of products. Think about how it moves through the manufacturing process, becomes a finished good, and goes on its way to the grocery store. And there are steps, processes that it goes through to become a finished good and then goes off to the grocery store. So here we have a side by side comparison of job order costing and process order costing systems. And the job order cost system, as you recall, uh, from our discussion last week, we have direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. We, we pull out the direct materials that goes into work in process. We use direct labor in the work in process stage, and then we add in some factory overhead. And then it, we take it out of work in process when it becomes a finished good, and it goes into uh, it goes uh, onto the job cost sheets, direct materials, labor, factory overhead and that we can allocate those to the total cost per unit. That was the job uh, order process, we, job order cost system that we went through last week. Uh, the example I gave was a guitar manufacturer. A guitar manufacturer will take raw uh, uh, wood, string, um, the metal facets, those are all direct materials. We take those direct materials, we put it into work and process, and then in the work and process stage, we have two different departments. We, we got the assembly department and, and the cut, wood cutting departments. First, it goes to wood cutting. They shape the guitar. Uh, and then it goes into the assembly. The, they take the guitar body, attach it to the neck, put on the string and the, and the facets, and then it becomes a finished good. You know, if you think of like an assembly line, right? It works the same exact way from left to right. On the left side, you got your raw materials, and on the right side, you got your finished goods. In between there, you have work in process. 
and it goes through the process and we add up all the costs for each customer order on the job sheets, right? As it's in each stage. That's the job order cost system. Process costing is slightly different because it's continuous. Job order cost system is based off of each individual customer order. The process cost system is a continuous process. So uh, um, let's use an example of ice cream. Oh, I like ice cream. Do you guys like ice cream? I like ice cream. Okay. So let's talk about ice cream for a second. So let's say you let, you got your favorite ice cream, go to the grocery store, you know, once every couple of weeks, you treat yourself to something nice. You're like, oh, there's that Ben and Jerry's I like so much. Let me get some of that, you know, some Rocky Road, whatever. So so you grab your you grab your favorite Rocky Road Ben and Jerry's, right? And then, uh, but think about how it got there. How did that ice cream get to the Safeway that you went to last week and you got your Ben and Jerry's? Okay, let's think about how it got to Safeway in the first place. It had to have started with ingredients, <laughs> right? It probably started with some dairy, you know, some milk some sugar. Uh, it probably has some uh, other small ingredients, right? So it starts out as direct materials. So in the process system for Ben and Jerry's, it starts, the direct materials are uh, your milk, your sugar, uh, probably a little bit of yeast, and what other whatever other ingredients. Uh so those are your direct materials. We take those raw materials, those direct materials, and we put it into the first department for work in process. And that first department for uh, ice cream, we'll say, is the mixing department. Okay? Think of like a big, giant uh, mixing bowl at a warehouse, right? Huge, industrial uh, mixing bowl. So we put our milk, our sugar, our other uh, our other raw materials into the mixing bowl, and it gets mixed up. <laughs> right? And there's someone who's watching the machine mix the batches. But that's your direct labor, and then you have a little bit of factory overhead. Well, I gotta have the power for the mixing bowl, right? I gotta have the space for the mixing bowl. So that's my overhead for the mixing department. Then, after we're done mixing our ice cream ingredients together, our, our milk, our sugar, or whatever else, we move it into, we'll say, the, mm, the pour, well, not pouring, what's the word? We'll put it in the uh, machine where it goes from the mixing bowl to a processing department, and in the processing department, we're finalizing the product. We're, we're freezing it. We're putting it in the freezing. We're, um, we're adding some final ingredients. And as we're doing that, we're adding, of course, more. We're, we're adding more material, more labor, more factory overhead, right? Because in the freezing department, where I'm adding the final ingredients and I'm freezing it. As I'm doing that, there's more cost associated. There's more material, there's more labor, more overhead. And then when it, when the ice cream is done in that second department, the freezing department, then we move it over to the packaging department. You got to package the ice cream, right? So uh, after after it's gone through its whole process, then we got to package it. We put it in the, in the pint size containers. Uh, through some machine, and uh, you know, so we're adding more materials. We're adding the, the the packaging. That's materials, yeah. And we're adding more direct labor, the people that are putting the ice cream into the packages. And then we're adding more overhead, the machines that are being used uh, to put the ice cream in the packages. And then once that's all done, it moves into the freezer storage unit to be sold comes finished goods, right? 
but you can see the difference, right? In job order system, we got work in process, we got finished goods, and it's based off of customer orders. In the process cost system, it's a continuous flow. We have uh, a couple different departments in work in process. And in the, each department, we have additional materials, additional labor, additional overhead. And uh, as it's move, as the product is moving through the work in process, we're adding more materials, more labor, more overhead until it becomes a finished good. And then you have your total cost per unit. Yeah. Well, you can see that how that works. Starts at the beginning of the assembly line, moves through each department, more materials, more labor, more overhead until it becomes a finished good. And then uh, once, once it's finished, when the Ben & Jerry's uh, Rocky Road is done, and that through that process, we, we ship it off to the grocery stores. And that goes to the Safeway that you got it from last week. <laughs> and that's my, that's my story. Well, not go ahead. Because, yeah, um, in a nutshell, how I understood um, job order and continuous um, process system, it is basically the, the finished good, the amount, the cost of the that's finished right. good. Right? Yeah, it, that's right. Yeah. And so it's, it, it's, if you think of it that way, uh, Lynette, the, the, the biggest, the biggest difference between the job order cost system and the process cost system is job orders based off of the individual customer orders. And we allocate direct materials, direct labor factory overhead to each customer order and process cost system. We're adding the materials, labor, and overhead at each stage of work and process, adding it up, adding it up, adding it up until it becomes a finished good, and then we ship it off. And so, and so that is the primary difference. Is and you're right; it's how we're allocating the cost of direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. That is the primary difference. So process could be considered as fixed and job order can be a variable cost in regards to making the finished product. To some I, degree. Yeah. To some know? degree. Yeah. That's a, okay. that's, a, that's one way of looking at it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. To some degree. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Uh, the, <laughs> tennis balls. That's a, that's a funny example too. I like that. Um, it's, is that, oh yeah, that is what they made in this example. That's funny. Okay. Uh, if we're going to continue, let's continue with our ice cream example. I like ice cream more than tennis balls. So uh, we can see that there are really three, di in, this, in, th in this company, there are three different departments, right? For work and process. For the ice cream, we got the mixing department, we got the freezing department, and then we got the packaging department. And the free and the mixing department, we're adding in our raw materials, and we're adding in some direct labor, and we're adding in some factory overhead. Then when that's all done, we take it out of the mixing department, we put it into the freezing department. That's the second one, yeah. And in that department, we're adding additional materials, additional labor, additional old factory overhead. And then when that's all done, we move it out of there and put it into the packaging department where we're, we're putting the ice cream into the packaging, you know, the pint sizes, and we're putting the lids on. So there's more materials. Someone's doing that. That's labor. And then, of course, there's factory overhead. So we're constantly adding to the total costs, right? And we're transferring them from one department to another as it moves down the assembly line. And this is continuous. So even after, a, like, for example, when I'm moving pints of ice cream from the mixing department to the freezing department, I'm restarting the mixing again. I got more ingredients putting into the mixing bowl, right? It's continuous. We don't stop. It's just a continuous flow of ice cream. That's, that's the idea. 
it it just it's it doesn't really stop. It's, that's what that's the biggest difference between process and job. Job costing it, it stops. It's done when the customer when we fill the customer order from the job order. But not in pr- c- continuous process costing. Process costing is continuous. We're continually moving. We're we're restarting each department. It keeps flowing through. That's that's what this nice graphic represents. And it also represents um, how things are being transferred, right? So we see A, B, C. It shows us how the inventory is moving from each department into the next, you know, through through these transactions. We got uh, a debit to work in process inventory for uh, the the um, and what this does is it shows the transfer, right? Letter A here. Debit work in process inventory for that second department. Credit work in process inventory for the core de- the first department. And then it moves into the next one. That's how, it, and you know how that works, right? We, we've talked about that. How you take inventory out of raw materials, you put it in the work in process. How do you do that? Well, we... Uh, we debit work and process inventory. We credit raw materials inventory. That shows the movement of the inventory from one department to another. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're just breaking it down individually for each work and process department. That's what this shows us. So how do we compute it? <laughs> This is where it gets fun. How do we compute it? Okay. When we start the process, we're taking our raw materials out and we're putting it into work in process. We're putting it into the first department within work in process. And in my example with ice cream, it's the very first stage. It's the mixing department. And the mixing department, they mix the raw materials together. They're mixing the, the milk and the sugar and, and the whatever else to make the ice cream. As that's happening, we're adding some raw, we're adding uh, direct labor and we're adding factory overhead. Then once that part is done, we take it out of the mixing department and we put it into the freezing department. That's the next stage in the work in process. As that's happening, I am con- doing this thing called converting. I'm converting the cost. And what it means is, um, as it's moving from one department to another within work in process, I am adding in the conversion costs of direct labor and factory overhead. And that represents the equivalent unit of production. Oh, sorry. Okay. And so here's how we compute it. We take the number of units being manufactured times the percentage that is complete. For direct materials, since I'm using all of the direct materials, we use 100%. So if I make 10,000 units of ice cream, pints of ice cream, and I'm using all of my direct materials, I'll take the 10,000 units times the percentage complete. Or percentage used, consumed, equals 10,000. 10,000 times 1, which is one per, 100%, is 10,000. If, if for direct labor, for each uh, unit of, uh, each unit being produced, I'm utilizing 20% labor. Okay, so uh, in this example, 10,000 units of ice uh, of uh, pints of ice cream times 20% for labor gives me $2,000. Okay, 
okay? For factory overhead, my overhead rate is 20%. So I have 10,000 units times 20% factory overhead gives me $2,000 for overhead. So we can see for to, in order for us to make 10,000 units, uh, my total cost will be for, uh, $14,000. Okay, so and the, the good news is a lot of the data will, will be given to you. So when you, when you get to the homework assignment or the quiz and you're working on it, the data will be there for you. It'll, it'll give you the percentages. Oh, you probably remember this. <laughs> I hope you remember this. If you don't, that's okay. But as one important thing to understand as we're making equivalent units of production is we need to understand how the company is valuing the inventory as it moves through work in process. There are, in, in work in process, there are two methods that we can select to apply to value the inventory in work in process. The first, as you may recall, is called weighted average. And the second, as you may recall, is called first in, first out method. Now, let's recap on what these are, because I know principles of accounting one for some of you was last semester, and for some of you, it was, it was a few weeks ago. So let's recap weighted average and first in, first out for inventory valuation. The weighted average is where we add up all of our purchases, and we divide it by the number of purchases, right? That gives us the weighted average. Purchase, not units. I thought or, it was um... or units. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. The total units. <laughs> like to get that, and that gives us the weighted average. And then the first in, first out method is the first. Uh, inventory that we produced or received is the first one out. And so we use that cost. And, and so it's important for us to understand or to remember anyway, <laughs> when we talked about uh, weighted average and first and first out inventory evaluation methods from principles of accounting one. Because, and the reason for that is because, uh, and I'm, I'm about to show you this, is in process costing, we commonly use weighted average or first in, first out to account for the level of production to assign it a cost, right? And so there's a process for that. And the first one we'll talk about is the weighted average. And some this part might be some, uh, uh, what do I call? Um, uh, we talked about it before. So this, some of this will be review for some of you. Uh, for, for others, this will be um, something you're trying to remember, <laughs> right? Because we talked about this last semester. And we definitely talked about it uh, earlier this semester for, for most of you. The weighted average method, there are a couple of steps we must follow in order to compute it. The number one is how many units, <laughs> right? So we got to figure out the fit. First, we have to figure out the physical flow of units through work and process. It, start, it starts off as raw materials. It goes through work and process, becomes a finished good, 
think of like a conveyor belt or a um, uh, uh, assembly line. Works the same exact way. Starts as raw materials go and becomes a finished good. It goes through a process. It goes through a working process. So number one is we identify the physical flow of the unit. The second step to compute the weighted average is we need to figure out what is the equivalent units of production. And the equivalent units of production could be a percentage times the number of units. And that usually tells us uh, how much is, is being produced at each work and process department. And the third step is we need to figure out the cost per equivalent unit. And then the fourth step is we assign and reconcile the cost. And I'll, I'll walk you through it. I'll walk you through all that. Okay. So this particular company, they uh, process chicken. They're a chicken processor, okay? Well, let's pretend this is Tyson. Okay, so this is Tyson. This is the Tyson floor. Uh, this is their this is their factory. So let's talk about uh, the layout first, because the first step, as you know, is to identify the physical flow of the products. Now, on the left side of our building, we have a loading dock where our raw materials, you know, the, the raw poultry, the uh, sugar, the whatever, oil, I don't know. I, I know nothing about this. But there are uh, raw materials, obviously. And those raw materials come in from the distributor. It's on the left side of your screen. And we put all the raw materials into our storeroom. You know, that's where we keep our raw materials. Uh, also on the left side of our building, we have the support offices, you know, the, the paper pusher office where they do computer and paper stuff, <laughs> like the accounting department, the HR, the whatever, whatevers. And then we also have our employee entrance. Now the employees come in, they change into their... Uh, aprons and their work clothes, right? And they punch in and they start, they, and they go to their assigned stations and they start work. So that's on the left side. In the middle of the building, we have what we call our shop floor. This is the production area where this is your work in process departments. Okay. And in this example, Tyson we have two different departments. We have our blending department, and they do different things in that department. And we have our roasting department. They're roasting the chicken, okay? So in our work and, uh, work and process departments, we have a conveyor belt. And it starts in the blending department. The first step in the blending department is taking the inventory out of our raw materials and putting it into work in process. So we're taking it out of the storeroom, we're putting it onto, we're unpackaging it, putting it on the conveyor belt, getting it ready to be processed, right? And then it flows down the conveyor belt. It looks like a C, right? It, st it starts at the top of the C and goes down. So that's your first part. The first department within the blending department is unpackaging it, putting it onto the conveyor belt. It goes on the conveyor belt. It goes into the blending department where they do all the seasoning and all the, you know, other scientific stuff that they do to chicken as it's, being, as it's going through the process, right? And then... Uh, and then it goes from that to that part of the department. It comes over to whatever the heck this thing is. <laughs> and it comes through. It go gets inspected. And then it goes into the roasting department. And in the roasting department, 
it goes through the the burners and it gets and it gets all crispy and all that jazz and you know the desanitized. I don't know. I'm just I'm, I'm making it up as I go. And then so and then it flows through the roaster and then it makes its way to the end of the conveyor belt. And at the end of the conveyor belt, it gets taken off. It gets put into packages. And then at, when it's done being packaged, it gets put into the warehouse where it sits as it's getting ready to be sold to the customers. And that goes, gets put on the truck and it goes out to the customer. And that is a process, right? That's why we call it process costing. But So step number one in the weighted average to understand the how we allocate the cost using weighted average is to understand the layout of the and the physical flow of the process of as the as the inventory rolls through the process. So we got our chicken, and uh, how, now we need to figure out uh, the equivalent units of production. So how do we do that? We look at um, our beginning inventory work in process plus units that we started during the month equals our total units accounted for. Okay. Beginning inventory that we started the process at the beginning of the month plus Units started during the month minus units transferred. Now remember, units transferred is when we're transferring the units to the next department. To the next department. That may be packaging department, whatever. But it gets transferred. How does it get transferred? It, it, if you look at the diagram from before, it's the physical flow, right? It's on the conveyor belt. So it starts, it gets unpackaged, goes through the, the, the scientific stuff. Then it goes to the roasting department and the roasting department to the packaging department. As it's moving from department to department, we call that being transferred. That's what, when you see transferred, it means it's being transferred from one department to another. There's cost, of course, associated with that. So to recap, beginning inventory, work in process, plus units we started during the month, minus units completed and transferred during the month, equals our ending work in process inventory. So this is for the month of April. At the beginning of April and of March, we started with 30,000 units. We added, we started an additional 90,000 units, giving us a total units account for 120,000. Minus the completed and transferred units of 100,000 equals 20,000. And the way to balance it is we accounted for a total of 120,000 units during the month of April. So, we uh, take that 120,000 and we apply our conversion costs. We have 100% of materials used during the month of April. That's our direct materials. We have conversion costs of 65%. For beginning inventory, we have 100% transferred out in the month of April. And that leaves us with 25% in ending inventory. Those are my conversion costs. Remember, well, if the con I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Okay, because I'm still, I'm trying to um, figure out how I can communicate um, my thoughts. When it comes to conversion costs, is direct labor and overhead. That's Am correct. I correct? That's correct. Yep. Okay. 
Yep. So, so what we're doing, we're, what we're doing here, Lynette, is we're, uh, as as you recall, in each department, we're adding additional labor and additional overhead, additional labor, additional overhead, and then as we're converting it, that means we're transferring it from one department to another, and in that transfer, we're adding additional uh, labor, additional overhead and that's why we call them conversion costs we're converting the costs and adding it to the total cost of of the of the product and so that's where that term comes from but yes you're you're you are correct and so we can see we can see how it's broken down in our data we had direct material cost of 81,000 for the month of april our conversion costs were 108900 108900 108, for conversion costs. It gives me a total beginning work and process cost of 189900 Then during the month of April, I have more cost, obviously. I got direct materials because I'm adding in additional material. I'm I got more direct labor. I'm adding in more direct labor. And I got more factory overhead. In this example, 120% of direct labor is our factory overhead cost. Uh, so 205200 I add up direct material plus direct labor plus factory overhead. And all of those together for the month of April are $655,200. I take my conversion cost plus my product cost, which is 655200 gives me a total production cost of $845,100. And that will be the end end balance for April? Is that, would that yes. be the end end? Yep, that'll be the total production cost for the month of April. Yep, that's right. And then um, April, May. So May, we would just subtract the, um, we subtract all completed manufactured products. And then that would give us the beginning. Um, for May 1, yeah. So, so, the so. Beginning cost for May. So only thing we would have to do is just subtract um, completed inventory from the month of April, and that would give me my beginning balance for May from that eight forty five. Yeah, okay. Yep, absolutely. Yep. And and that's and that's how we'll start the month of May. So so we'll start with twenty thousand units in uh on May one, because we ended April thirty with twenty thousand units remaining in work and process inventory. So that'll be our beginning balance. Okay. So, to recap, the uh, weighted average. Step one, determine physical flow of units. We started with 30,000 units, uh, uh, beginning work in process. We added in or started processing an additional 90,000 units. It gave me 120,000 units. We transferred and completed 100,000 units, and our ending work in process is 20,000 units. We reconcile by matching the total units counted for during the month for both uh, units processed and units transferred and completed. And we can see the two match, so that means it's reconciled. Sometimes it might be off by a little bit, so we got to make, make adjustments. Just like we talked about when uh, in a principles one when we talked about adjusting entries, but we're not going to dive too deep in this course on on, on that one because it, it gets pretty complex. Step two. We're going to compute the equivalent units of production. There's a nice simple formula for that. Nice simple formula for to compute equivalent units of production. And that is, we take the number of whole units completed and transferred to the next department, 
plus the number of units in the ending work and process inventory. Now, if looking at our uh, example for the, the Tyson's chicken, we got direct materials, and then we have our conversion costs, which is you know direct labor, factory over. The direct materials, we we had 100,000 units, and we transferred 100% of them. So that's 100,000. 100,000 units of production. We had an additional 100,000 conversion cost because we had 100% of our units, right? So we completed and transferred 100% of 100,000. So I got direct materials 100,000, conversion costs 100,000. At the end of the month, I had direct materials 20,000 units at 100%, and I had and since I had 100% of units, trans, uh, units transferred, I take the 20,000 units of the units transferred times 25%, because 25% is my total conversion cost, right? 25% of the, of the total units gets me 5,000 uh, conversion units. Conversion units, that's... Uh, out of the 20,000 units, I actually finished 5,000. And so my total units converted is 105,000. My total direct materials is 120,000. So, of course, uh, uh, my that looks like my ending inventory would be about 15,000. And the third step... Y'all good? Okay. The third step is, of course, to compute the cost per equivalent unit by taking your beginning work and process inventory plus costs incurred during the period to get your total cost divided by the equivalent units of production that we got from step two. And that will give us our total cost equivalent unit per production, $3 per unit. For direct materials, $4.62 for a conversion cost per unit. So the formula for the cost per equivalent unit is total cost divided by the equivalent units of production that we got from step two equals the cost per unit of production. That kind of caps our uh, weighted average, right? And so as you go through the process of computing weighted average, just remember to follow those steps. I promise you'll be fine. The last step. Oh, yes, I'm please, sorry. Lynette. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Is, can this be applied to people who want to open up food trucks and restaurants? Um this managerial accounting that we add in now, and that can help us in regards to, yeah, um, like taking yeah. a potato and then turning it into some home fries or something like that. <laughs> yeah, actually, yes, that's that's very true, Lynette. You 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 really could do that if you wanted to. Uh, you know, it's 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 a very detailed it's a very detailed uh, uh, way of of doing it for a food truck. But your cost will be spot on. <laughs> so to answer your question, yes, absolutely. You, you could apply this this concept to, to something like a food truck for sure. Especially if you're making the same thing continuously. Uh, you know, the, the finished product is the same. You go through the same process. Yes, you could. It would be probably a little too far for something like that. But you could if you wanted to have your cost down to the closest penny. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent question. And the fourth step for uh, the weighted average is to assign and reconcile the cost. So 
Our direct materials, uh, our uh, equivalent units of, of production is $3 per unit. We finished 100% uh, of 100,000 units. So we multiply our units, uh, equivalent units of production times the number of units uh, completed. So we have 100,000 times $3 is 300,000 for direct materials. Our conversion cost was $4.62 per equivalent unit of production times the 100,000 units completed, giving us 4,600, uh, I'm sorry, $462,000 uh, of conversion costs. That means that our total cost of units completed during the period was 762000 at the end of the work in process period, I had 20,000 units in direct materials and 5,000 units of conversion sitting in process. So that uh, means I had $60,000 of direct materials. That's $3 for equivalent unit of production times the number of units in work in process, 20,000. 3 times 20 is, uh, is 60, 60,000. Uh, and then, of course, we have our conversion cost, $4.62 per unit of uh, equivalent unit of production times 5,000 units remaining uh, in work and process inventory at the end of the month, giving us $23,100 of conversion costs at the end of the month, still in work and process. The total cost of ending work and process inventory is $83,100. I take my total cost of equivalence, uh, I'm sorry, my total cost of units completed during the period plus my total cost of ending work in process inventory for the period equals my total cost of units accounted for, 845,100. It's a long process, but as long as you follow the steps, you'll be able to uh, to figure out the uh, average weighted cost. Average weighted cost. And you just follow the four steps. Step by step by step. And I promise you, you'll get it right. <laughs> you just follow the steps. All the amounts are given to you. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, when it comes, to, when it says, oh, completed and transferred out, what's the percentage? Then you take that percentage and multiply it by the total number of units to be able to, to figure out that factor. That's usually where most students have trouble is, uh, you know, multiplying the percentage that's given to you times the number of units and then making sure that you add all those up. It's best to use a spreadsheet for something like this uh, if you really wanted to. And, and, uh, and of course, I will be providing um, some additional example material for you in the classroom. So just like I've done for the previous chapter. So that way you can try this out for yourself as well. <clears throat> so here's our cost data for the month. We got our raw materials at the end of the uh, end of March, 100,000, beginning work in process for both departments. Uh, total materials purchased to start the next month. Materials used during the month of April for each department. Indirect materials. Uh, payroll overhead. Payroll, of course, being direct labor and indirect labor. Overhead. And that gives us all of our total costs for the month. We call this a cost data sheet. And the, cost, the cost data sheet shows us the individual cost for uh, the whole month. It's kind of nice. <clears throat> okay. Now let's take a look at how we record the flow of the material costs within process costing. And this is just kind of like a closer look at how the inventory comes out of raw materials, goes into work and process, goes into work and process, <laughs> and then now we apply factory overhead to work and process. So there's a couple of journal entries uh, that we need to make 
as the material flows through the process. So the first thing we do is we need to buy raw materials, right? That's how we do anything, right? We got to start with our raw materials. So to purchase raw materials on account, the first transaction is I debit raw materials inventory to increase my raw materials inventory. And I credit accounts payable. Why? Because I bought it on account. So remember, when you want to increase an asset, an asset being something like cash or inventory, accounts receivable, right? You want to increase an asset, we debit the asset account, in this case, raw materials inventory. And I'm crediting accounts payable because I bought it on account. Professor. So, yes, please. A while. What if you were to buy it on cash? You would have um, you would still debited inventory, right? And then credit cash? That's correct. Yep, that's right. 100% right. Yep, so you would still debit raw materials inventory and then you just credit cash if you paid with cash. Absolutely. Very well done. So that's my first transaction. Now, what I need to do is I need to start using <laughs> my raw materials inventory in the work and process departments. So how do I take it out of raw materials inventory and put it into work and process is I debit my work and process inventory departments departments because remember this this is process costing so i debit my individual work and process departments with the amount of raw materials that's being used in each department so i debit work and process inventory roasting department debit work and process inventory blending department and i credit raw materials inventory what this does is i put it into work and process and take it out of raw materials inventory. And this transaction shows me how, how much cost is being assigned to each department within work and process inventory. And it shows me how it's being taken out of raw materials. And then the third transaction is I need to allocate any indirect materials being used through factory overhead. How do I do that? So remember, indirect materials are materials that do not make up the majority of the cost. In our example of Tyson's chicken, an example of this might be uh, seasoning. Okay, the seasoning is not the majority of the cost of the chicken. The chicken itself is the majority of the cost. The seasoning, which is another raw material, does not make up the majority of the cost, so therefore we classify it as an indirect material. So in order to allocate the seasoning being used on the chicken in the process, we debit factory overhead and we credit raw materials inventory. Yes, so what? Yes, so what about like you know, the packaging, will that be factory overhead as well? Yes, that's like correct. The yeah. I mean, the, the, the chicken, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're, you're correct. So the packaging that the chicken goes into would also be considered indirect material because it's a very low cost of materials. Yes, that would be. So, so, so basically anything that is low cost and it's not a major, um, cost that, that that is factory overhead correct that's correct so okay. so direct materials is would be the majority of the cost right so that would be the chicken itself in this example the indirect materials would be things like the packaging and the seasoning those are very low cost items as it makes up the whole cost right so so yes that's correct okay thank you you're very welcome excellent question Okay, so we talked about the direct materials. 
What about the direct labor? The labor is also very important to understand because there is labor associated with each process, each department within the process, yeah? So let's allocate some labor. And it's mostly pretty straightforward, right? The first transaction in labor is I would debit the labor for each department of work and process inventory, okay? Because remember, as the process flows, starts as raw materials, goes into work and process through a couple departments, and then becomes a finished good. As it's flowing through, I need to add the direct labor to uh, the direct materials, and then I'll add in the factory overhead. Okay, so how do we do that? We debit work and process inventory for roasting department. We debit work and process inventory for the blending department, and we credit wages payable. Why are wages payable? Because we haven't paid them yet. <laughs> so we debit work and process inventory to increase the inventory cost for each respective department for the wages worked. And then we credit wages payable because we haven't paid them yet. The second transaction is I need to also add in my indirect labor. Now remember, indirect labor is a part of factory overhead. These would be like the supervisor's salaries, the, the office staff salaries. It's indirect labor. Why is it indirect? Because they're not directly working on the process. They're not physically touching the chicken. So because they're not touching the chicken, we classify it as being indirect labor, which is a part of factory overhead. So we debit factory overhead to increase factory overhead, and we credit wages payable to increase the wages payable. Because we haven't paid them yet. And then the last transaction is, we got to pay our employees for the month of April. <laughs> so we debit total factory wages payable and we credit cash. Because you got to pay your employees. <laughs> and that's how we allocate labor costs in the process. So, Professor, I just want to understand how we came up with all of these numbers. Is it by like calculating, like, let's say, for example, one employee, right? The pay is $15 an hour, the minimum wage. Is that how they come up with these numbers? That's correct. Yep. And because we have employees that work in, in, in each department. I got employees that work in the roasting department and employees that work in the blending department. I take the uh, amount of hours that each employee worked in that respective department and I multiply it by the, hour, the dollars per hour that they earn. And I add them all up. And that's how I got 171000 for roasting, 183000 for blending. Interesting. Yep. Thank you. You're very welcome. Have repeat you repeat that one more time, Professor, please. Sure, of course. So in order for us to figure out how much uh, cost to assign for wages for each department, I take the amount of hours that each employee worked within each department and I multiply that by their dollars per hour, their wages, yeah? And so that's how I came up with 171000 for roasting, 183000 for the blending. So you take your the total hours work times that uh, dollars per hour. And that gets you your totals. Okay. Yep. Good question. Um, and then once everything is said and done, from me reading the um, chapter, the previous chapter, um, work in progress inventory, we debit that once it's done, the amount that we've um, actually put into production, and then That's we right. will um, then we would debit the um, wages payable because we paid them. So it's come from credit, and we take that to debit, and then after everything. Um, is complete, all work is completed, we take it from out of inventory mm -hmm. um, as a as a debit and we put it as a credit. 
That's correct. Yep. So, okay. so, so when it comes out of work and process inventory, we debit finished goods inventory, and when, then we credit work and process inventory. That's correct. And then when it's and then when it's sold, it be, it becomes cost of goods sold. Got it. Yep. Great. Wonderful. Good questions. Okay, so we talked about materials. We talked about labor. Now, of course, you know, we got to talk about factory overhead. <laughs> our factory overhead, those are all our indirect costs that we cannot directly trace to the process. Okay, so we do it indirectly through factory overhead. And so I need to be able to allocate things like my insurance, my utilities, uh, you know, things like that, cash that I paid for the factory overhead, uh, uh, depreciation, uh, you name it, right? There's a lot of costs that go into factory overhead. So I debit factory overhead and I credit uh, the um, liabilities and the, and the assets that went into it. So I credit prepaid insurance, credit utilities uh, payable, cr credit cash, credit accumulated depreciation for the factory equipment. Because they're related to the process, but it's indirect. They're indirect costs. So that what the that first transaction does is it allocates everything for factory overhead, whatever is included in that, right? Your indirect expenses. And the second transaction, in order for me to allocate that factory overhead to the work and process departments, is I debit work and process inventory roasting, debit work and process inventory blending, credit factory overhead. And what that does is I'm applying the factory overhead to the work and process. First, you allocate factory overhead, then you apply it the factory overhead to work in process. And that's what this shows us. Fun, fun, fun. <laughs> that's actually probably the most straightforward one. <laughs> okay. Now, once we're done with the manufacturing process, we got to take it out of our uh, work in process and put it into our finished goods inventory. And then when I sell it, I take it out of finished goods inventory and put it into cost of goods sold. So here are the transactions for taking it out of work in process, putting it into the second department work in process, taking it out of there, putting it into finished goods. Here's how it works. Okay, so remember, during the month of April, I completed 100,000 units. And so I need to show how that, that, that flowed through the department. So it's, I took it out of raw materials inventory, put it into uh, work and process inventory blending department. That's the first department. So the first transaction here shows me when I took it out of the roasting department, put it into the blending department. So you debit work and process inventory blending, and you credit work and process inventory roasting. And all this does is it shows us the movement of the 100,000 units from the roasting department to the blending department. The second transaction is after the blending department, that's the second of the two work and process departments, right? When it's done, I got to put it into finished goods. So I debit finished goods inventory and I credit work and process inventory for the blending department. And what that does is it shows us how we're transferring the completion, the completed goods, 
right? There's that word transfer again. Remember, when you hear the word transfer, it's when the product is moving from one department to another. Transferring. We're moving it. And then the last entry is when I sell it. I debit cost of goods sold and I credit finished goods inventory. Now remember, when you debit cost of goods sold, it shows up on your income statement. It comes off of your balance sheet. You all remember that. 201. <laughs> Yes, um, yes, can you please go back to that slide? I yes, I'm a little bit confused about nine A. Um, oh, how did we like uh, transfer the hundred thousand units from one department to, the to other another? Group? Like, sure. Well, remember the physical flow of the product, right? So there's a conveyor belt, and the ch the chicken starts in the in the uh, roasting department. It goes down through the conveyor belt and it makes its way to the blending department. And as it's moving down that conveyor belt, I have to transfer the inventory from roasting to blending. Mm. Right. Okay. And so that's why I debit work and process inventory blending to increase blending department. And I credit work and process inventory roasting to decrease exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that it shows the physical movement of the inventory from one department to another. Wow. Okay. I see. Yeah. Um, so what about 9B, the finished goods inventory? Um, it only has uh, blending. What about the label? Is that not part of this? Yes. So, so there's no more roasting. Roasting's done. Mm. It, it, it went from roasting to blending. And now it's at the end of the conveyor belt. So it's done. The chicken's done. When it's done, mm. I have to put it into work in, uh, I'm sorry, I, I need to put it into finished goods inventory. Yes. And I take it out of work in process. And that's why I only touched the last department of work in process. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank Great. you. Awesome. Good. Thank you for your question. So let's talk very quickly about current trends in uh, process costing. The total cost of products over time typically goes down. Why is that? Because of this thing called automation. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that we take into consideration as we identify costs. We take into consideration the process design, you know, what's the layout of the factory floor, make, make the movement of goods uh, easier. What's the customer orientation, customers, customer tastes, customer preferences? What services are available? What's the yield? Continuous processing just-in-time production, and robotic automation. These, all these factors, we take them into consideration uh, as we identify trends in process manufacturing. Just-in-time production, as you probably recall from uh, previous chapters, is when we manufacture something pretty much to order. It's just-in-time. Robotic process automation is relatively, uh, it's a newer concept in accounting. And what it does is it automates processes. It takes out the human element and it uses computers, basically, to control the, the environment. So what, what we find in manufacturing very frequently is there are more computers and robots that are actually doing the work rather than humans. And the humans are working alongside the robots to ensure the quality, right? And that, that is a, a fast-growing trend. There are hybrid cost systems. I'm just going to touch basis on this. We're going to dive too deep into this. 
But I want you to, to understand, in addition to process cost system and job order cost system, we have this thing called a hybrid, which is kind of a combination of both process costing and job costing. And really, it's just used to determine the total cost of products and services. Because in, in the real world, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. It's just kind of like Lynette, uh, when you were talking about the food truck thing. There may not be a one-size-fits-all. Like process costing may not be the only system that you would use. You might also use job order costing, okay, to, in a combination of the two. It's based off of the business's needs. So if the business does a little bit of both, you know, job order and processing, then you would need a hybrid. And so you combine the two systems. And some companies use this to kind of standardize the process to meet the customer needs. And of course, it's an excellent way to monitor and control costs. And monitoring and controlling costs is, is what this course is all about. Because as managers, as business owners, as people who are analyzing financial statements, you need to know how to monitor and control the cost. Because it's, and it's so important because we don't want to have cost overruns or have something cost more than it should. And so that's why it's, a, it's an important concept. And the, uh, one of the last concepts we'll talk about is using the first-in, first-out method for process costing. As you recall, the first-in, first-out method simply means that the first units that are being utilized are the first ones to leave the factory. First in, first out. So we're going to use the same uh, example that we used earlier for our company, for our uh, Tyson. And so we got uh, some data here. Uh, beginning, beginning work in process, 30,000 30, units, 100% direct materials, 65% uh, conversion cost. Direct materials cost 81,000, conversion cost 108,900. During the month of April, uh, we started with 90,000 units, transferred out 100,000 units, means we completed 100,000 units. We have our direct material, direct labor, factory overhead uh, costs. And then, of course, we have our ending work in process. Number of units still in work in process, direct materials, and conversion costs. So we take all that information, and we the first thing we need to do is determine the physical flow of units, just like before. So we have our work in process inventory beginning uh, plus the units started during the period, giving us 120,000 units total. And uh, we reconcile this with the number of units transferred out plus the ending work in process inventory. That's step one. Step two, we compute the equivalent units of production, just like we did before. In this example, we got uh, direct materials, uh, 30,000 times 0%. We didn't have any uh, direct materials to begin the month with, so zero. Conversion cost, 30,000 at 35%, it's 10,500. The second uh, part is the equivalent units started and completed during the month, 70,000 units third step is equivalent units of any work in process. We got our direct materials, 20,000 at 100%, 20,000. Conversion costs, 20,000 units times 25% is 5,000. To get our ending units of production. Uh, yeah. And the third step, of course, is to find the cost per equivalent unit. So in this case for direct materials, I have my cost incurred for the period divided by the total units of uh, production equals the cost per equivalent unit 
of production, $3.10. And I do the same thing with my conversion cost. Total conversion cost for the period divided by units of production, giving me the cost of equivalent unit of production, $4.40. Professor. Yes, please. Can you go back to that screen? So for um for this chicken, for the uh -huh. company in general, it would it will cost four plus three is seven, seven dollars and fifty cent when you um add the direct materials and the conversion. So each chicken That's that correct. they make. Okay. Now, can we go back to the very first step? Because I was, I got a little lost right in my comment. Yeah, no can problem. You, <laughs> uh, right here? Over that. Yeah. Can you, how did we get 120 again? Wait. Sure. Yep. So, so we take the beginning uh, balance, the beginning work yeah. the inventory, plus yeah. the units that we started during the month. Which was 70. Uh, 90. Oh, I'm looking all the way at the top. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. We started with we started yeah, we with started 90. ninety. That's yeah. that's all right. But uh, and then so what we do is we reconcile that with the uh, units completed and transferred out, which is a hundred thousand. How do we get hundred thousand? Is we have our thirty thousand beginning units plus seventy thousand units that we started during the during the month. That's how we got a hundred thousand. Uh, and then we add that to our ending work, work and process inventory, which is 120000 So that's how we reconcile. That, that's how we make sure that our total units accounted for is correct. Shit. I figured I'm a little lost. But I, so they made, so they completed 70000 And along with... Um, uh. You're almost there. So they completed a hundred thousand. Okay, during, so thirty thousand. So thirty that thirty thousand is what was completed from last month, right? That's, we, that's actually what we started with in, in work in process. We started with thirty thousand units. Yeah, but that's that was like the crossover from last month. Yep, that's right. So that okay, so that was like the crossover from last month, and then. They um, started with 90, but they they completed 70. Is that what I'm seeing? That's correct. So we start we, we started an additional 70,000 uh, 70, units during the month of, of April. We started the month of April with 30,000 units sitting there ready to be uh -huh. processed. Yes. Okay. We, we, then we started another 70,000 units during the month of April. And that, okay. we, that so that's how we completed a total of 100,000 units. So we completed okay. our beginning inventory plus another seventy. Okay. And then we ended okay. up ending the and and then we we still ended the month of April with twenty thousand units sitting there ready for month of May. Okay. So with it, I'm almost there. Okay, go ahead with the class. I don't want to take up. No, you're, class. you're fine. You're fine. So you the know. ninety. So now I'm trying to figure out this ninety. The ninety thousand. Sure. Units. So, so we started work in process with thirty thousand units. Yes. Okay. And also during the month we started ninety thousand units. Okay. And so we we started ninety thousand units. That's how we we're left with twenty. Because we because units started and completed is seventy thousand. So that's how oh, okay. twenty. You got it now. Okay, wait a minute. Hold on. Hear me out. So this okay. is how I think I got it now. Okay, so okay. in the B okay, so let's say this is May we're working on. So at the end of April, we had thirty thousand units brought over that we're still working on. So during the month of, um, so that's our beginning um work in progress inventory. And so I ordered I ordered ninety thousand, right? Okay. Yep, right. I yep. ordered ninety thousand more. Uh -huh. So that brings me nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That brings me to the twelve hundred. However, uh -huh. okay. However, I only, um, I only com completed pro finished product of a hundred thousand. Correct. Okay, which leaves me with twenty thousand units still left to be worked on that I'm going to bring on into the month of June. You got it. 
Okay, thank you. That's 100% correct. You got it now. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Wonderful. Awesome. And then, of course, then I went through the process of allocating or computing, sorry, the equivalent units of production. And then I get, I found my cost per equivalent unit by taking the cost incurred during the period divided by the equivalent units of production that I found in the previous step. So it's $3.10 direct materials plus $4.40 conversion cost. Give me this $7.50 per each unit of chicken. And this is what my uh, uh, my cost looked like, right? This just kind of shows us how we started. So beginning work in process, plus my conversion cost, direct materials plus additional conversion costs, given my total co cost of finished and transferred out, plus <laughs> my direct material conversion costs, uh, Giving me a total cost ending work in process. So total cost plus ending work in process giving me my total cost accounted for. That's how we reconcile you. Yeah? That's the last step of that. But you can see, you know, how the direct materials and the conversion costs uh, go through each month. And that's that's really what we're trying to show here. And that, my friends, is the conclusion of our uh, process costing discussion. Uh, I'm going to head and uh, stop the, the recording for this chapter, and we will begin our next one, which is cost volume profit analysis. And we'll discuss the most important concept in business called break even. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.